Conventional wisdom tells us that Donald Trump's campaign benefited mightily from his use of Twitter. Today's guest shows that it wasn't the tweets themselves that mattered, but the television coverage that they generated. He's Jacob Groshek, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down each weekend with storytellers and scholars to help us understand the narratives and even the technology for delivering stories that shape public life in the United States. Joining us today is Jacob Groshek, who is a professor of emerging media studies at Boston University. Jacob, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm so, really happy to be here. Let's let's talk with just some basic uh, understanding for the audience. What is emerging media? So, believe it or not, this is a question that I get asked all the time, and and the difficult part of answering that question is not to be too specific about platforms, but when we think contemporarily about what emerging media studies are and what emerging media themselves are, we usually identify them as things that haven't been studied yet, but that are emerging into the public space. And so right now we could think about things like wearable devices in terms of Fitbits or Apple Watches. You could think about things like streaming television and the way that's disrupting conventional broadcast models. You could think about virtual reality, augmented reality, and of course something like the transition to uh, mobile communication that's become more and more dominant over time. So these are just a few of the ways that, that we conceptualize emerging media in the program I work at at BU. And I would imagine that it is uh, always changing. If it's emerging media, if, uh, you know, a decade ago, I imagine social media would have been part of the emerging media framework. Where do those big platforms fit into that landscape today? Right, so that's a great question, and it's, it's not to say that we don't study some of the dominant spaces in social media like Facebook and Twitter and others, but we also try to keep our... Um, our, our ear to the ground for what's coming up next and when we think about that right now we might think about something like Snapchat for example that hasn't been studied a lot um, in the scholarship but that is an important uh, platform for use among millions of people so in that way um, when we frame emerging media we like to, to think of it in some way that that media that that demands your attention that is emergent in that sense so so that gives us I think a good conceptual space to think about uh, media that's 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 emerging, broadly speaking, but that's also being diffused rapidly and affecting people's lives in meaningful ways. Do you study or think about what the appeal is of emerging media to the individual, to the mind? You mentioned two things that I found of great interest. Snapchat, which almost immediately became this huge thing. It wasn't advertising, just word of mouth, it spread, boom, and streaming media, which is shifting Hollywood and, and the TV and movie industry dramatically from where it used to be. People latch onto this quickly. What is it in, in, in the human personality or the, or the human mind or, or in us that makes us go, wow, something new, great, let's check it out? So I think novelty is an important aspect of, of any new media platform that comes out and that, that becomes prop popular and, and reaches a broad audience. So, so that's a good jumping off point. But for us, where things really start to get interesting is not when things are just new, which is why, for example, we don't say we study just new media um, and society, um, but rather things that, that are being embedded, that are becoming part of people's lives on a regular basis. And when we get to that point of embeddedness and the fact that I'm waking up and I'm turning on Netflix as opposed to turning on the morning news, we do start to study you know, what impact that, that has. Um, but I'll be honest and I'll say we, we don't spend so much time or I don't spend so much time trying to figure out exactly why it is people gravitate to certain devices or certain platforms. But you are certainly seeing the shift in, in, in viewing and in, in, yeah. in audience engagement and where people are going. I mean, it's, it's almost done subconsciously. I'm just thinking of my own life. I mean, I'm in the media, of course, um, but just in the last five years gone from network TV to watching so much more now on either Amazon or Hulu. Yeah or Netflix, it's just 
for a variety of reasons, and I'm, it's not about me, but but, but but is there, is there uh, I mean, I look at the at, at some of the behaviors from some of the of the of the big streaming companies, and they seem to be trying to, in some in some ways, uh, replicate what you get from traditional over-the-air broadcast media. So you know, I, now you, I can get my local news through some streaming services, right? Uh, they're they're sort of matching the content. There's greater selectivity because I can decide what to watch when I want to watch it. But there's still there's still some some almost communal need about everybody watching the same newscasters every night. That that seems to still shape the way these streaming services are are evolving. Is that is that accurate? So, so I I think that there is a an innate sense that as individuals we do want to be up to date with the with the latest content, right? And this took shape historically through broadcast television where we shared few channels and so the content was much more limited. I think now we still see the same pattern start to emerge and you're absolutely right that the streaming landscape is becoming more and more robust with services that provide not just entertainment content but also news, document documentaries and other ways that people can engage with what we would conventionally consider more civic affairs type of media. And so in this way I mean I think the, the main um, difference of streaming, and we're studied, to study this at BU, is, is how people are engaging with it and how the affordances of those platforms from both a psychological standpoint and a, a content standpoint come together to, to give users more agency, to give them more control. And so we're trying to better understand the processing of those platforms and, and what that looks like compared to quote unquote watching conventional television. So, and we've started to study streaming television in, in a, a few papers that I've been a part of with, um, with some of my doctoral students, and our findings have been substantially different from people who are using uh, conventional television, which is to say those that, that are streaming television more often, more frequently, are generally more engaged in politics. They participate more often online and offline. They're also talking about politics more often online and offline. And where, what we found really interesting and vital about those findings is that people who are streaming television more often were actually talking about politics with people who are not like them, with others who came from different backgrounds, who have different political views. And so, so this gets us to a question of why. And we think that there's a possibility here for, for there to be some cohesion coming out of this new media platform as opposed to fragmentation, which is to say m maybe we're streaming the same shows and we go online or we're offline and we're talking about those shows and we start to put on political, uh, use those as political vehicles to better understand what's happening in the, in the world of, of contemporary politics and current affairs. So, so it's, it's a, of course, a very uh, first look at the, uh, the world of streaming and how it's intersecting with, with many different aspects of our lives, particularly the political ones, civic ones, but we're also trying to open up and look at how people are using streaming uh, television to time shift to do things uh, that relate to academic performance, that relate to health, that relate to um, just, just general engagement and, and trust in others. And there's a lot of early work that's coming out that says the, the content, of course, on streaming is substantively different. The way we engage with it is substantively different. And because there aren't regulations necessarily around what time things are being aired or what can be shown, there's also an opening up of which viewers are seeing which content. All of which is to say, yes, I think at the end of the day, we all do want to um, have these experiences, these media experiences that we can share with others and that we can use as platforms to, to engage. Um, that's fascinating. It is. It's absolutely fascinating research. And now, you, 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 you mentioned, you used the term uh, conversations talking about people who may have divergent views politically. Yeah are now talking, uh, where are they talking? Are we talking at the, you know, the, the stereotypical water cooler? Are we talking online, all of the above? Or where are these conversations So happening? in the, in the uh, studies that I referenced, we, we do look at basically two spaces, an online space and an offline space. And we ask a series of questions, I, I think about 10 or 12 different questions about not necessarily where they're having the conversation. Is it at the water cooler? Or is it in my backyard? Or is it around the dining room table? But rather, are you having these conversations offline, that is to say in real life with people you know or people face that you don't, face to face, face. yes, exactly. Yeah. And then we also have those conversations taking place online okay. and maybe those, broadly speaking, online conversation can take place through email, can take place in chats, can take place on places like social media and Twitter, um, Facebook particularly. So, but those are the two pillars ap around which we try to identify the different places of talk, which is not maybe um, quite so granular to say is it Dinner room conversation, dinner table conversation, or is it, uh, you know, someplace else? 
So I know in some of your research, you've looked at the role that social media played in the 2016 election. Yeah. What did you find? So um, one of the main papers that, that we had come out on the 2016 election was a way for us to analyze whether or not social media, as the title of the paper goes, helped populism win. And so as I'm sure we're all aware, coming out after the 2016 election, there was a narrative that tried to help explain how it was that Donald Trump won when almost all of the analysts, pollsters, and so on predicted that he was going to lose. And quite rapidly after the election, there was a narrative that said it was social media. And social media particularly helped to facilitate people's um, exposure to news and information. It helped to engage conversation. And as, as we've come to find out since then, the ads that were being circulated were related in many ways to misinformation, disinformation, and what we might broadly conceive of as quote unquote fake news. So, so we had some survey data that went back um, into the primaries of 2015, so November to December of 2015. And we had a national representative panel of about 1,100 people. And what we asked questions about there were whether or not they were using Facebook, they were using Twitter, they were using social media in an active way, in a passive way, or potentially in an uncivil or hostile sort of way. And surprisingly enough for us, we found that those folks that were using social media in an active manner were not actually more likely to, to um, report a preference for populists, particularly Donald Trump. And so that finding for us was at, at first, blush, at first blush at least a push against this narrative that said it was social media that was cultivating echo chambers and filter bubbles and that these echo chambers were changing people's viewpoints to such a way that they were now convinced, perhaps because they were exposed to some sort of fake news or misinformation, that they made a vote choice or they preferred Donald Trump. So we investigated that a little bit further and what we found was that people who were active on social media were approximately two and a half to three times more likely to have what we would call cross-cutting um, or heterogeneous information uh, talk networks. In other words, those folks that were active on social media, they were getting political information, they were talking about political information with other people who, again, were unlike them. They were not, as far as we could tell, according to our survey data, in some kind of filter bubble. And so these findings put together for us, I think, construct a different narrative that say it's, it's, it's possible, of course, that people may have been exposed to misinformation, fake news, and that may have been sponsored or, or materialized from foreign actors like Russians. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they were convinced or that that was the primary medium through which they received their information. One last bit of uh, research on that topic. In that same study, we found that people who were more reliant on television as a, as a as a medium, as a channel for getting news and information, we're far more likely to express a vote preference for Donald Trump, which then I think gets us again to a different space of understanding um, you know, direct effects of media that aren't necessarily what we would anticipate. So is, is a, uh, we need to do a station break, but um, is the, basically the takeaway from that then that, uh, that the social media use by, the, by candidate Trump was not uh, the determinant factor, but the mainstream, or not the mainstream media, but the traditional media's reporting on it? Is that the bigger? So that's a big part of, of what we're finding. Now keep in mind, we didn't examine the content that to which people were exposed. We didn't look at that independently. But I think there absolutely is, is a, a process that's taking place in media whereby what's said on Twitter, particularly by influential actors like Donald Trump, is reported on in the media, and uh, in particularly television media. And in that case, our position is that it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a direct linkage in that maybe some of those folks who are watching television aren't on Twitter at all, or they're not on Facebook, they're not using social media for politics, but they're getting those messages, they're getting that information through television, and that is helping to shape what their uh, vote preferences are. We're going to take a quick moment for station ID, and then I'm going to throw it over to Wayne. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. You can hear this program three times each weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's popular Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS channel, number 124. We produce the show each week with a remarkably talented crew at the studios of Rhode Island PBS in beautiful Providence, Rhode Island. I'm Jim Lutis. In my day job, I run the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island. If you want to connect with me on Twitter, 
I'm at J.M. Lutus. My co-host is an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal and author of 17 books. G. Wayne Miller is on Twitter, too. He's at G. Wayne Miller, all one word. And our guest this week is Jacob Groshek, an associate professor of emerging media studies at Boston University. He's on Twitter at a new media prof, spelled just like it sounds, a new media prof short for professor. So, Wayne, over to you. Let me just say right here, I find this incredibly fascinating. I mean, this is really sort of cutting edge research, at least the way I would interpret it. A couple of terms I'm not sure I really understand. Maybe you can define a filter bubble. I'm not sure I've ever heard that. What is a filter bubble? So a filter bubble is uh, basically a concept that was introduced by Eli Pariser in his book of the same title. But it, it, it gets to the concept that if I'm online, broadly speaking, and if I'm on social media, more specifically speaking, I'm likely to connect with others that are like me. In other words, my friends, my family, others that share similar political views or religious beliefs. And because I'm connecting with other like-minded individuals, the notion is that I am insulating myself. I'm creating a bubble around the, the information and viewpoints and things that I receive such that competing ideas, like those that might be expressed by people from a different background or a political orientation, don't reach me. And if I am exposed to those, those bits of information that I don't like or are divergent to my viewpoints, I can easily push them out. And, and, and doesn't Facebook, with its algorithms, sort it in that way? They, the, your news feed comes up from like-minded or family or friends or so that you're not getting a diversion of view. They're deciding mathematically, their computers, their software engineers, who you're going to be most likely to see. Is that not true? I think that's absolutely right. And that's how social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter are designed to provide you information that you like in the same way that Netflix will provide you a list of shows that you like based yeah. on what you've liked in the past. So there's a, an economic model that's bumping up against a, a political model. And what we're trying to get at here is we're, we're not even necessarily saying that the filter bubbles may or may not have existed. But what we're saying is that is that people were still exposed to cross-cutting political information as they were on social media. And even if they were getting a lot of information that was similar to their pre-existing viewpoints, it didn't necessarily change their vote preference. So Mark Zuckerberg has made a point for a long time of wanting to connect the world. Yeah. We connect the world. And in fact, that is true on one level. But on this level, maybe we're not connecting the world. Maybe we're connecting like-minded people, people who think in the same box. Any, so, any credence to that? or? Yeah, I mean, there, there's been an ongoing debate in, in the scholarly field and the literature on this as to whether or not we're, we're um, you know, bridging or bonding, right? Are we, are mm. we bringing like-minded people closer together and thereby fragmenting ourselves further and further? And, and, and is that connected to the process of polarization? And there's a, a lot of credence to be given to that argument, which is why I think it's important if we start to have findings like the one I mentioned earlier on streaming television. If people are coming together and, and they're talking about something that's not necessarily political, maybe it's uh, House of Cards, maybe it's um, uh, you know Game of Thrones, these are things that we like, even if we're from different political backgrounds. And as mm -hmm. we talk about them, we may well use them as vehicles for political conversation. But in that sense, we're trying to build, we're potentially building a cohesion that could be absent if we're in different, more politically explicit spaces where. I'm in a, a, a Facebook group uh, that's uh, only conservatives, or I'm yeah. in a, a group that's that's only for liberals, right? And those two groups don't don't bridge that much, right? They bond. So there, I think there is a challenge that we we need to find some either algorithmic or techno algorithmic or technologically informed way, or even one that's a combination of human and um, algorithms working together to still produce that diverse uh, set of viewpoints that exist in the content, not just necessarily as a byproduct of things that we already like. So in that same study about, uh, about populists and social media, uh, did, did you, did, and, and I, I'm not sure if you looked at this, so if you didn't, we can just move on, but did, do you find that populist candidates actually employ social media differently, or is it how it is received by their audiences that, that might be different? Well, full disclosure, we didn't really examine the, the content itself. So, so all I can really do is sort of speculate in the sense that other studies, uh, for example, we based our measure of populism on, a, on an earlier piece by uh, two authors named Oliver, Oliver and Ron 
and they had this article in, in uh, the Annals of Political Science called uh, The Rise of the Trump and Volk. And what they did is they used a content uh, analysis system that was informed by algorithms and compared dictionaries. And basically what they identified were patterns of political speech that were more uh, populist in nature than others, and they came up with a ranking. So in that sense, they did identify that based on their own speeches, actors like, in this case, Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, and Ben Carson were more populist than were others like uh, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and, and for example, Hillary Clinton. But for our sake, we didn't actually get to the point of, of measuring whether or not those more populist candidates were, were using um, the medium in a different fashion. The underlying assumption is that, and other evidence has suggested that, yes, that is the case in terms of their, their content and their, their structure. Can you extrapolate from your study and, and, and thinking about the 2016 election what role social and emerging media will play in the election coming up this November and then there's one two years after that yeah. presidential year 2020? Have you given thought to that? Well, I think it's going to be hugely important. Right, and um, I think we're at a point uh, as a field and also just in general as a nation where we're thinking about and we're trying to better understand what happened in 2016 to uh, avoid the potential problems that, that may have existed in 2016, particularly with ads and fake, fake news and misinformation entering from, from foreign um, actors. So, so I think it's going to be very important, but I think we're also uh, learning more about this. And I think as in general, we're, as users and consumers of media, particularly social media, I, I think or I'd like to hope that people are becoming more savvy and, and more aware of the environment in which they're living. Do you, so, you know, there was, in, some of your earlier scholarship too looked at uh, the link between the, the rise of the internet and democratization. Uh, and now, so we don't talk about the internet really as emerging technology anymore. No. Uh, but it, are, are these emerging technologies as social media, are they good for democracy? Well, um, that's a great question. And, and I started out uh, as a doctoral student back in 2004 trying to answer what seemed to be a, a very optimistic sort of idea that the internet could somehow make the world a more democratic place because of its more participatory nature, because of its non-hierarchical means of production and sharing. And so I set off to answer this question. I looked at historical data going back to 1946 and looked at patterns that, that had that had been diffused um, in other types of media around the world, right? So I looked at newspaper diffusion, radio diffusion, television diffusion, and I tried to say, are there, is, is there any evidence for us to think that the internet, broadly conceived, can succeed in, in ways that, for example, television has not, right? And so my answer was a, a, a cautiously optimistic yes. And, and my first studies um, looked at a data set that, that went up to 2003. And what I found there was there was a lot of positive correlation between internet diffusion around the world and, and the shift towards more democratic regimes. But I also found that, that a lot of that relationship was, was, was codependent, basically, in that places that were already on a trajectory to become more democratic were, were likewise investing more in a free and open media, and that free and open media was helping to cultivate a, a, an environment for democratic change. So it wasn't necessarily you know, a silver bullet, so to speak. You know, the, it, as the internet was diffusing, it wasn't just by default making the world a more democratic place. Um, and we see that narrative, though, that same sort of idea rise when something like the Arab Spring, um, you know, uh, happens. And we look at that and we say, well, what is this? This is a social media revolution. Could it be used to organize protests in the streets? Right. Yeah. So, so the mobilization aspect can't be ignored. Um, but as the scholarship has increased and as, um, you know, I've spent more time working on this, you know, I, I did a replication of some of my earlier work. And whereas before, we had more positive evidence in that data set that ended in 2003. And I just had another study come out with one of my doctoral students um, last year. And, and the study, the data set went up to 2014. And what we found, excuse me, in that sample, we did some time series analyses. And we found that there were four countries that were more democratic than we could have statistically expected them to be had there been no internet, let's say, in an alternate reality. But for us, even more interesting, there was 14 countries that were less democratic um, in terms of a statistical forecasting model than what we could have expected there to be. So I think this really opens up a critical space, which is to say we have um, a profoundly powerful technology right now in the, sen in, in the, the, the internet and, and what it's able to do um, 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just going to automatically result in positive democratic change. And I think a lot of the, the devil is in the details right now in terms of thinking about the content that's being produced, that's being shared, who's making it, and, and what those viewpoints look like, because I think we have the possibility to drift radically away from what we would think about demo uh, deliberative democracy and the idea of uh, uh, an egalitarian uh, Habermasian sort of public sphere. Haven't we seen this repeatedly throughout history? The advent of, of a giant or a greater or, or ground shifting technology changes the way people think, changes their lives, changes how they organize. I'm thinking of the automobile, but we could use other examples. Sure. And you can never predict, really, what the ultimate outcome is going to be. Is that, is that a fair statement? I, I think that's uh, absolutely correct. And I think there's oftentimes been a lot of similar utopian prognostications about other media technologies, uh, radio, televisions. Yeah. When these all first began to emerge, there was similar uh, hype surrounding them as a positive force for democracy, most of which has, as we now know, gone relatively unrealized. Do you, uh, we've got about a minute left here. Um, it seems ultimately that the question for me is, uh, what impact do these technologies, does this new media, the emerging media, uh, have on our discourse as a nation, on the conversations that we're having? Are they, cor is it coarser? Is it more positive? What's the impact it's having? So I think as we've shifted more and more to different media spaces, the, the general nature has been um, to be less and less civil, to be um, increasingly hostile. And one of the other uh, areas that I'm working in right now is, is the shift to mobile communication. And we talk about social media as it's one thing or the internet as it's just happening on our, our laptops or our desktops, but we know that's not the case. And in fact, 70 to 80% of what's posted on Facebook and Twitter come from mobile devices. And in a separate study, again, with another one of my graduate students, we found that there was uh, significantly more uh, forms of hostile communication taking shape from mobile devices than from what we call fixed web devices. In other words, as we've shifted from talking about things in person to talking about things through different media to going online and now through mobile devices, we're seeing the nature of that communication change and, and there seems to be evidence uh, that it's changing for the wow. worse. It's a remarkable, I, can't, I it's, cannot wait to see that, the results of that. It's a remarkable conversation. Jacob Groshek, thank you so much for being with us. He's from Boston University. That's all the time we have today, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook or Twitter, or visit us at PellCenter.org, where you can also catch up on previous episodes. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next week for more Story in the Public Square.